Uh, we can call the meeting to or order at 703. Can I have a motion to review and approve minutes from November 17th? I'll make a motion to approve the review and approve. Can second. I have a second? Up, oh, Phil, yeah, all in, all in yeah, favor? We got a yes. roll call. Uh, so Phil, yes? Yes. Michael, yes? Yes. Denise, yes? Yes. Ashley, yes? Yes. All righty, and I'm a yes, so that's unanimous for the minutes. Um, Shelly, uh, financial statement? I do not have much of an update for you. Um, there wasn't a whole lot to discuss this month, um, but we did sign, or you did review and sign 10 warrants totaling $37,679.63. Um, I did share the general fund and school choice expense reports, so I'm happy to take questions on those if you have them. Those were through November 30th. Um, and I did give you a school lunch snapshot. Um, perhaps this is a bigger discussion for us. Uh, we are operating with a net income, a loss right now of $8,500 year to date. Uh, given our start of year balance, um, we do have um, <clears throat> we had some funds, but we are overall in the negative by about $2,200. So um, certainly not in a good spot as we continue to move through the year. Uh, the revenue projections don't look to be um, in a spot where we'll be able to cover particularly the wages, which total about $33,000. Um, and our revenue is definitely going to be lower the more days we're in this remote only model. We are still serving meals for pickup, but certainly not nearly as many meals as we would be um, if students were in a hybrid model. So um, I'd like to recommend that the wages for school lunch be moved over to the local budget. Um, we can wait to do that. You know, again, we've had this conversation where we have to rectify it by the end of the year. Um, but I think, you know, we've got September, October, November, and most of December under our belt. And I think it's pretty clear at this point that revenue is not going to be where it needs to be. Um, I can take your lead and, and we can continue to hold off and I'll just give you these monthly updates. But um, six and one half dozen and another, I think we're going to end up in the same spot, unfortunately. So that's um, the school lunch update that I have if, if you want to. Ask well, questions. I'm happy to take them, or you could vote to make the move now, um, which really isn't necessary, we don't think, but it's nice to have school committees support and have a formal vote on, on it. We've been in that spot since I've been on school committee, which was before my daughter was born, and she just is 18. So it's a very familiar spot with school lunch. So, I mean, I you know, and at, at the rest, risk of repetition, Shelly, because I know we had this conversation last week about this. But, you know, my concern about stuff like this is that when you when you take part of, you know, you're, you're trying to keep score or keep track of how much money you're really losing in a given program or um, I mean, I, and I don't mean to sound completely like budget minded, but that's what we're talking about right here. So um, but, uh, you know, and, and, and so when. When you that when you then take like the salary part and you put it somewhere else, and I understand the reasons for the bookkeeping reasons or the accountancy reasons, and they're they're real. Um, and but but the you know you, you do lose track then of what the real you know what the real score is, and in something like food service, I think keeping score is important, and so that's it. Just you, it, it then becomes a matter of forensic reconstruction. Um, yeah, which which isn't part of the regular system that that, that so, so it's a some uh, you know it it, it, uh, it so to the extent that it obscures what the real what, what reality is that, that then that's difficult for me but I understand why she want why why Shelly wants to do it and it makes sense and because one way or the other you're going to be po paying the the overages from the same place and it doesn't. Uh, yeah, and, and we can certainly wait till year end if you want to continue to see it in the format that it is now so you can see what the, you know, the true net income is. Um, you know, obviously, we're still missing some things when we present the numbers because it doesn't include things like benefits, 
you know, workers comp, all of those pieces, which really are paid for the town by the town. So we never really get this, you know, clear picture anyway. Um, but yeah. I do see your point, Phil. It, it makes it easier to see it if we continue to do this process. If you did want to make the move, um, you know, we I could still manually come up with the calculations for us. Um, but we can also wait. You know, the town isn't going to require us to do anything until at the end of the year when they say, okay, you've got this negative balance. You know, you've got to rectify the account. So we can certainly sit and wait and I'll stop asking you to make the move. And, you know, we'll just look at the numbers every month. But, you know, totally happy to follow your lead. I'm still stuck at Elaine's daughter's 18. Can we go back to that. When did that happen? Yeah. <laughs> crazy. Yeah. Crazy, crazy. Um, I'm just thinking really probably too far ahead right now, but you know, next year are we gonna want to have the school lunch budget in the local column or are we gonna want to move it back to where we are now where it currently is? Um, so I I think this isn't something that's new obviously to the district running and a deficit has been happening however there's a big difference so running in a deficit of 2000 at the end of the year versus 35000 is a significant difference right and so what our current food service director had done was started to build up a program that could at a minimum fund itself or nearly fund itself and because of COVID and eating up surplus funds last year and not bringing in as much revenue this year, we're not even in that position. So I'm not sure that we can go back to the way it was in a year from now. We could build the system in the same way that we're doing where, you know, we let the account go negative and we see what it looks like at the end of the next year. But then at that point, we don't necessarily have a spot plan to pay for these wages from, which doesn't put, make me feel very comfortable when we're talking about managing our money. We could put a placeholder in school choice so that, you know, we have that as a back backfall. Right now, I see that Conway this year is going to have some savings and other general fund line items to pay for this where we didn't plan for it, which is really fortunate that I think we're going to be able to do that and not have to touch those other reserve funds. Um, so we are getting a little bit ahead and it, it is something that we are going to have to talk about, Michael, in the very near future. Um, again, I'm happy to follow your lead. I'm happy to make a recommendation as to what I think would work best. And then we continue the discussion from there. But this isn't a problem that's going to go away in the very near future. <clears throat> All right. Well, I'm postponing for a couple months until we have a sense of how we're going to handle next year's budget when we start that all round. So, thanks. Right. Thanks, Shelley. You're welcome. So, are we saying we just want to watch it for a few months and we don't want to vote right now? Is that the consensus? Yes. Yeah. Not yes. Okay. All right, we're going to keep an eye on it and just move forward then. Okay, and we already signed the warrants, so on to public comment. So who's got the documents to read? Um, I can I can read the CPAC statement if you want me to. Okay. So this comes from the Frontier Regional and Union 38 Special Education Parent Advisory Council. It's uh, dated today, December 15th, 2020. The Special Education Parent Advisory Council wants to thank the district for providing in-person learning to the highest needs students during this current period of remote learning. This has been a lifeline to families. The transition between remote and in-person learning is hard on everyone, but has been particularly hard for special education families. We would like to share some systemic concerns for this com committee to consider as we all move forward. There was poor communication between the district, district and families regarding the Thanksgiving remote, remote learning week. 
This communication has improved with the most recent switch to remote, but there are still improvements that could be made. When the call went out last week, many special education families were not sure if their child would be in person or remote. This caused a lot of stress for families. We have been in contact with CPACs across the state whose districts are using a tiered approach to communicate with families about which special education students will be learning in person during remote periods. In these districts, administrators can quickly email families to say all tier one or quote, all tier one special education students are eligible for in-person learning and can contact their, their liaison to discuss potential options. All tier two and three special education students will be learning remotely at this time, end quote. We would like the district to cons also consider 504 plans during this process and not just IEP students. For special education students who are learning remotely, compensatory services need to be widely available without the uphill battle families are accustomed to in this district. There are going to be times that vulnerable children miss out on what they should get due to the nature of this pandemic. Families will be much more understanding if they know that extra services will be readily available this summer to make up for what is being lost right now. Beyond the educational impact, we want to share the emotional toll on families. Disabled students rely on consistency, and the sudden shift left nearly all of them struggling emotionally and behaviorally. This stress impacts both students and their families for weeks. Having clear communication from the district could reduce some of this stress for families. CPAC is asking that the district improve their communication so that special education families know what to expect when remote learning is implemented. We also ask that the district make a commitment to ensure that COVID compensatory services are readily available to ensure a more equitable experience for all special education students. We thank you for all of your time and continued collaboration. Holly Johnson, co-chair, Aja Cerrone, co-chair, Carrie Thurlow, secretary, and Crystal Brown, treasurer. Thank you, Michael. Any comment? The, yeah, the, the point could have just as effectively been made without referencing or de declaring things poor and uphill and, and everything else. You, you can make your point without taking shots. That's my, and the points were good ones. Yeah. I assume communication's been improved, Darius? When the decision was made to go to remote, I met with um, <clears throat> um, all the administrators and we called each family that we felt were the most vulnerable learners, but the teachers did and set up plans to bring them in the building as soon as possible. Um, on the flip side, I would say that we, um, the majority of our programs were in operation the following day. And understanding that these are teachers and staff members who um, are coming back into the building despite that the fact that their colleagues um, um, are at home, you know, have, have the ability to teach remotely. Um, and the fact that, you know, basically the, the tension level around COVID did reach a level where we thought we had to go remote, or we, not we thought, where we went remote. So I just want to kind of say the, on the flip side, um, um, you know, we are, you know, I understand that there's there's other, me, other special ed families that were not contacted because they were not part of that decision, but um, was also a lot to move forward to get those programs up and running the following day. So I just want to say, I just want to compliment where, where the hard work was and, you know, we'll continue to work on these kind of things there. Um, and we'll talk about, I'm sure we'll talk about this when we talk about the COVID update, but um, it's hard. A lot of people need services in person in the school um, and we're kind of at conflict of the two right now, you know, um, everybody would be in if that was, if we had it our way kind of deal in the sense of, uh, without COVID in the picture. So um, anyway, so that was kind of a choppy answer, but you know, we did, um, we, we are listening to them and we're trying to make adjustments to such. Do you have a tiered approach? Nope, that mean, I, I heard about that idea um, today. Um, 
you know, if we had a longer closure, do we, you know, do we bring in certain kids on certain days? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I got to think that through. And I, I did hear, you know, this, this, we obviously got this email today um, and I heard it at the Sunderland meeting prior to this. Um, so it's an interesting idea. It does bring, start bringing students into the building and can we do it in a separate amount? It's going to be done by building and each building has different needs with different number of learners. You know, um, in some of the buildings, it's, you know, how do you, where's the quantifying line to be considered vulnerable and not vulnerable? Um, is a student who has no internet at home has grown without an education plan, the same as a student who is having trouble accessing without the help of a teacher, who's more vulnerable? You know, so, you know, in maybe the, the IEP ones, have, you know, take greater time to make up, um, make up for lost times. But there's all this, I mean, there's a plenty of there's discussions within that. So, you know, um, even team will continue talking about whether or not we do a tiered approach, especially if this is, um, you know, if we're not back in person. Um, as soon as we want to be. Um, I wanted to make a comment. Um, I did want to thank Darius for all of the hard work that he's put into ensuring that we can be in a safe environment. Um, I want to thank Darius and the rest of the administration for how we've tried to be really thoughtful about both the hybrid and remote um like we've been in hybrid for quite some time compared to other school districts in the area and i feel like our um approach of working very closely with the board of health um has kind of helped facilitate maintaining that hybrid as much as we have been able to um and i realize there's a lot of complicated discussions that occur between administration, unions, um, and the community and the boards of health uh, to make that all happen. Um, and I, I also really understand these concerns that CPAC is bringing forward. Um, there are students that really are deeply impacted when we're in a remote setting and being able to find a way to maintain them in that in-person setting uh, creates a huge improvement in their delivery of instruction. And so I, I, what I've seen from the district as a whole is a willingness to be thoughtful and flexible in a, in a safe way. So um, moving forward, I have I hopes that we will find some new ways of, of solving these problems. So thank you. Any other comments? It does seem everybody's working really hard. So, you know, to, to try to keep everybody happy amidst a pandemic. So anyway, um, uh, and what was the other letter? I didn't see my email to see what the other letter was. must have come in today yeah uh donna forwarded it looks like it went out to um potentially the entire union 38 crew um called returning to hybrid model darius is that one that we were scheduled to read for this meeting i don't have it on the list donna gave me i have the um, that Carol and Paulette are listed, but I believe, I'm not sure if you guys are doing independent ones. Um, They're here for the school council, Darius. Okay, to help and so school. I have the CPAC and I have Amanda, but I see Jamison's here um, for the, uh, I don't think that's for the, uh, oh, my brain's already fried. That's for the um, um, anti-racism work. So, um, I don't have the list of anybody else there. So unless you got one directly and you want to read it, that's that's fine. I, I don't have it on my list. I don't have it prepared to. Right, right. Yeah, I'm trying to see why why Donna didn't forward it to you and Kristen in addition to everybody else. So um, 
I mean, this says just forward to the school committee. I don't know that that means it's got to be read at school committee. I would say yes. And I see what you're saying. Yes, I um, that was sent to me. I gave it to Donna to forward to the school committee because it said forward to the school committee. That's not a request to be read during public comment. So people, okay, you guys receive letters all the time. People have to specify if they want to be put into public comment because if, you know, if I sent my concern to you and then you went and told everybody that may have been not have been my wish. So I think you have to be specific that they want that to be read into the public comment. Great. Um, while it's a public record, I, it's not something I I think. Uh, that's how I feel about public comment. You guys can make your own judgment on that, but I think someone has to be specific. They want their name attached to something or an opinion. Right, they that's want us to read it. Uh, public. Darius, I just wanted to point out that it's only addressed to you as well. So, I get it. Yeah. All, All right. right. Yeah. So we are done with public comment then. Um, on to unfinished business. Uh, we want to do COVID or anti-racism first. You know, I think Jamie, Jameson's, if Jameson's there, yep, see Jameson's him, see here. emoji there. Um, if he wants to if we can get him off, we can go correct papers, see his family. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. I am here. Um, I've learned that keeping the video off keeps me from breaking up in the middle of my spiel. So I'm going to stay with the emoji right now. Um, how's everybody doing tonight? Hope you're well. I want to, Give you the December update from the uh, anti-racism committee subcommittees. Uh, we'll give it to you by subcommittee. So we'll start with uh, professional development. Um, the high school had their fourth workshop with the racial empathy consulting group from UMass on the 9th of December. Uh, the last two workshops focused on social identity and personal identity. Elementary professional development has concluded for the first semester and will resume, <clears throat> excuse me, in the second semester, focusing on classroom implementation of the ideas they work on this fall. From the curriculum subcommittee, um, eighth grade is continuing with its uh, stamps from the beginning curriculum. There's been some pushback, but overall it's going well. Uh, elementary has created a glossary of terms to be used at all elementary schools that will be distributed soon. Uh, five books per elementary grade level have been chosen and will work into professional development for second semester. In terms of school culture from that committee, uh, FRCOG communities <clears throat> that care and advancing anti-racism in schools timeline update. Uh, in January, there'll be an assessment of what's already in place or being done. And in February and March, student focus groups uh, will meet for on the ground feedback about the work that's going on. Logo voting will begin shortly. The committee is discussing how we might support teams with fundraising for new gear, particularly teams that have the Feather logo. And the school policy subcommittee it's working on recommendations for revisions to student handbooks and looking for student input in some sections of the handbook. And we're preparing to send out a staff survey to check for understanding about discipline procedures for um, instances of hate speech in school. And that is uh, my update. If you have any questions, I can carry them back to the individual subcommittees or um, as a co-chair, we can I can take it back to our triumvirate of of brains to talk about. Well, Jameson, I'll go ahead and ask the same question I ask of every consultant. Are you are you satisfied with the progress that the district is making? I am. I, I think that um, Cultural change is, is a slow process that we always want to go faster because it feels urgent in the moment. Um, and so I can understand that there might be some people who are impatient with our pace, but um, in, in some senses, it's, it's, you got to think of it more like um, seasons instead of days, you know? And, and we're in our first season, literally, of thinking about this on a grand scale across the whole um, broad um, breadth of the district. And you know, I'm in I'm in a funny place. My my child is a senior, so I've been, you know, this is this is 
my 12th year, 13th really, um, in Frontier. And while we never had any complaints of our own, that doesn't mean there's not work to be done, right? And so I'm, I'm glad the work is going on. I, you know, I want to be a part of it next year after she's gone. I don't know what role I'm going to play, but I think that, um, you know, it's, I think that just like the country, it's work that's going to have to continue for quite a while before we can feel like it's done. Good. You can always run for school committee. <laughs> I, I did that already. Um, you know, maybe, maybe when, uh, Maybe when she's off to college, we'll, we'll see what kind of time I can free up then. All right. Then you have to work harder to pay for college. So this that, is that's true. <laughs> this is true. All right, folks, I'll, I'll, I'll wave good night. And I'll let Thank you, get you very on with much. The meeting. Have a good one. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. All righty. And now we are on to. COVID-19 update, something new and unusual. I, I'm hoping I'm going to get the vaccine this week. So, woohoo! Yep. Then I'm just going to go dancing down the middle of the street. Well, after I get the second one. <laughs> anyway. Careful, there's some of us testing for the back of the line. Um... <laughs> so, am I unmuted yet? Um, the uh, so I guess you know the COVID nineteen update. So I mean, I just kind of tell you, we came off a, a meeting at Sunderland where it was very, um, it was a very uh, heated uh, public comment exchange. Um, we, that the community really is, and I just kind of want to share that with the school committee. If you haven't received emails, that the community really is divided on this subject. Um, with those you know talking about. Uh, the need for students to be in person and the level of risk that's being taken and versus, um, you know, the keeping staff safe and um, just the cross. I mean, and I think the actual part of the good part of the public comment is I thought it was kind of a, was an equally balanced back and forth of different points. And I kind of was like, when I, when I was my turn to talk, I'm like, I'm like they kind of just said it all, all the points, the need of students to be in school, the need to keep teachers safe and the kind of this kind of exchange. So, um, so I'm just saying that because there was, you know, either good or bad. We didn't have that this evening. Um, but, um, you know, we did, you know, last week I did move the, you know, after consulting with chairs, um, moved in a, uh, to move the district to remote because all of our metrics were kind of shattered by the latest surge in Franklin County. And so right now what I'm doing is I'm working on creating um, updated metrics. We have updated those metrics since August, as you remember, we I presented you an updated version in November and looking at and also meeting with the, uh, the teachers union um, as well to do, because they helped us develop the first set about what does it look like moving forward. And I think the big, I, the, one of the big things to think about is that we were so fortunate this fall to just not have cases in our community. You know, when, when we talked about like, I could safely say in every single meeting, I know where all the cases are. You know what I mean, because there's only a handful, or two handfuls, and it was that that person who went out of town over here, and it's that college group over there, or you know, it was that kind of thing. And and last week it exploded where it was, you know, it was just outlets everywhere where transmission was taking possible, and we you know we have community spread, and our metrics were based on you know bringing alerting us to that, and I think that the pause, while I think you know I really do want to see kids in the building as much as possible. Um, I think we have it's a balance between the two, the two conflicting. Um, I'm not sure they have to be conflicting, but the two, the two different views on it, whether or not people should be in school or not. And so I, I right now we're going to be developing, you know, these new metrics that, um, looking at metrics, not just developing new ones like oh, with a new point, with a new data point, but how we look at data. Because some of the data points, you know, we put it together like we'll never reach this, and then we reached that number, and then we were like. Well, that number doesn't really mean anything. And what does that number mean? And if this town versus that town, we talk about positivity rate. Well, you know, in that kind of thing. And how does that affect the school? And um, that whole conversation kind of has to be updated. And so that's what we're doing um, right now. I have a meeting tomorrow um, to go through them. I already have a draft of some ideas to put forward to 
um, to teachers. And we built those internally the first time. So the idea is that I'm going to build them internally. I have to have, I just kind of, what I don't have said is what the school committee's next step is. And I'm thinking that perhaps a joint meeting, it's going to have to be during break, um, to go over um, to go over the metrics. And right now on the 29th, the boards of health are meeting on that Tuesday um, to discuss, you know, what are the numbers at? Have we perhaps by then leveled off or perhaps come back down? Or are they still surging, you know? Um, and looking at whether or not we should be reopening um, on the 4th. And so I think the school committee, my thoughts are the school committee needs to look at those metrics prior to the boards of health, because I think it's coming from the school. If we're developing them, um, I think I want people's other people's thoughts on them since it's going to be dictating how we make decisions around the opening and closing. Um, <laughs> closing, you know, remote. Um, so that's kind of what I have, but I'm also taking advice. My thought was I was going to contact the chairs to have a discussion about how and when we should do it because it's very difficult right now, just so people have an understanding of the my head spinning on this is that I have 37 people I report to about whether or not we open or close school. We have 25 school committee members and 12 boards of health. And 12 boards of health members. And not that I'm calling every single boards of health member or directly related. They're all part of this decision-making process. So the idea is like, oh, let's all get together. We can talk it out. Well, maybe, but if everybody wants to, you know, really talk and if there's going to be public comment, I mean, you're going to need a, it's going to be like a Senate hearing. Um, you know, so, you know, I, I got to figure out how we, work within our systems. Um, and I'll be honest, you know, it's a lot of it's hindsight, you know what I mean? Like, gosh, why did we set it up this way? You, you know, you're, you know, Modesto, you're, you're, you're out of your mind to do it this way and blah, blah, blah. Well, it worked for a while. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so we didn't know the problem until you're in the problem. Then all of a sudden, like, you know, who would have thought our metrics were, when I saw those metrics, we were like, we're nowhere going to come near those metrics. And I was telling people, you know, in, even when we had our first outbreak, that outbreak, yeah, we had that out, you know, in school happening in October, late October, early November. Um, we're still like, this is this is not community spread, this is an incident, you know. So we have to evolve along with it, and we also know more. Um, and I think I think not only do we know more, I think our teachers know more too. And it not when I say teachers, but just staffing and what people feel comfortable with and what people don't feel comfortable with, and they've kind of you know, we've seen it in practice. So um, anyway, that's the I started to babble. So I just I think you need to uh, go a little easy on yourself there, Darius. None of us have been through a pandemic before. So, you know, I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I, unless you're you know, around in 1918 and went to the, you know, Fenway Park and got it there when last time we won the World Series before the latest run. But, you know, I mean, it's everybody's just doing the best they can do. Yeah. Can I make a comment regarding Conway? Um, so. I can only speak for Conway, um, you know, I can't speak for any other school in the country, um, but at Conway, we've, we've had vulnerable learners back from the start. Um, and we've had vulnerable learners back four days a week from the start. And by definition of vulnerable learners, it, it's, it's very wide and variable. So um, students on IEP certainly are vulnerable learners. Um, students who have no internet are vulnerable learners. Only children, some of those children are vul vulnerable learners. Children who have siblings with special needs who are home, who need parent attention are vulnerable learners. Students who have their sibling, siblings on the opposite days that they are coming because we couldn't match all the kids up are vulnerable in that, in that it doesn't give the parents any days to go to work or do things. Um, we have been extraordinarily cautious at Conway Grammar School, um, uh, and as I'm sure other schools, but cohorting and um, face shields during the holiday time and full PPE and windows open. And we still have our tents up. We're still eating outside and learning outside when we can. Um, but I will say, and, and and I want the kids in school more than anything. They're happy in school. They're learning. They're doing a great job. But when Darius checked in, he checks in on the schools always. He calls the schools always to see how it's going. What's the update? And now I could get teary eyed because I hadn't felt that way on except on that day when he called to talk about how it was going and. 
to be honest with you, I would have given it four or five, three or four more days, and we probably wouldn't have been able to staff the school just because of different scenarios. We have not had any COVID outbreaks at the school. We haven't had anyone with COVID. And I didn't sleep at all. And um, so when Darius makes decisions, he's always checking in with the principals to see what's going on to the day to day. And so for Conway Grammar School, um, we know how difficult, and I, we know those vulnerable learners that we will get back ASAP. But we, but we also knew that we were, we were sort of in our own lockdown that week ourselves based on just various things going on with community and various other things. Parents were keeping kids out after Thanksgiving for a little bit. Um, and so I have to say it's been going extraordinarily well at Conway Grammar School, but we are so, so tight with caution because we want every staff member to feel safe and we want every family being happy sending the kids to school. And so I, 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 Darius is way too hard on himself. I mean, I, I was, I literally slept that night and I called him and I said, I'm going to be to work about two hours late because I'm so exhausted from the week because we just didn't know if we were going to make it. Um, and I, I totally, I, I know exactly the parents that are struggling and I'm going to be reaching out to them in case there's extended closure after the break. But keeping our staff and students safe, obviously, is the first priority. And like I said, we we started four days a week with some children right from the start with a large number of children. So we've been going strong since, you know, we started back right on through. So anyway, that's just a little Conway Grammar School COVID update. Thanks for that, Kristen. I mean, I, I really think that, you know, when you I've you know, dealt with this at work a ton. I've had people really sick from COVID. I've had people who feel like it was not nearly as bad as a bad cold, you know, and it's all theoretical and whatever until somebody gets really sick and, you know, winds up in the hospital from it and or dies, you know? So, you know, we have to take those precautions because it is a reality. I mean, that that can happen. Um, so, you know, we, everybody's just doing the best they can, but that's just, you know, I don't, I don't think anybody needs to be, you know, beaten up on or blamed when everybody's just trying to do the best they they can for everybody involved at, at every minute. So. Uh, the public always likes a good self-flagellation. Um, but, you know. It's, Thanks, Bill. <laughs> 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 I gotta go. I'll walk down the weight room and drop some weights on my feet. <laughs> there you go. There you go. But you know, what I I just like to bring it back just a little bit to the board of health and um, the metrics because you know that one of the interesting thing to me is that the the first unplanned break right after Thanksgiving. You know, it, it's true there is a good partnership between Darius and and, and, and the chair of the of board of board of health. But that particular clothing originated out of the, well, I mean, not originated, it was a shared decision, but the, it came from the, the, the Board of Health sort of angle of the relationship. This past one, the decision to close sort of came from the administration angle of the partnership based on the metrics that, that, that were agreed upon. But the, the Board of Health sort of, they sort of expressed surprise that you went ahead and did that um, at, at the meeting. And, 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 and they recommended that we redo our metrics because, you know, although it's true that you, they lost track of where the, the cases are coming from, they were able to say that the schools were not spreading it. And, and so, so they suggested that, that we redo our metrics to account for the fact that there can be, uh, it can be in the community writ large, um, but and still be safe to go back to school. And so from that perspective, when you look at like the reasoning that you were giving about um, how the teachers union and the, the Sunderland crowd and all that were, were saying, follow the metrics, follow the metrics, follow the metrics. But, um, you know, the, the, so, you know, but in reality, all we've kind of done is move that, that goal post or move that decision down to January because in January, these numbers aren't going to be any better. 
um, or if they are, we're still going to be over on some of our metrics. It's a, it's a likely assumption, I think, or, um, or, or right around there. And so we're still going to have the same discussion in January, you know, you know, and, and, and are, are you, are you thinking about going, adjusting the metrics in accordance with that board of health? The, I, I don't know if it's a so recommendation. Exactly. Yeah, so you, you, I think you put exactly what I was, you know, um, I was talking about that earlier, Phil. I, the that we are going to look at the metrics and and tweak them, um, not only in what the numbers are and what they represent, but to give some meaning to them. You know, because right now it was they were just markers, and they were markers to make decisions off of, and nobody explained. Well, you know. What does the marker mean? It was markers for the Board of Health consultation is where we left it. And the Board of Health is making those decisions. And so the Board of Health should not have, well, Board of Health members could have been surprised. The chair should not have been surprised because I had a conversation with them. You know what I mean? So, you know, they, you know, they, they kind of said in a public meeting afterwards, you know, you know, whatever. But I had, you know, long conversations with them where they understood my perspective that if you build this is where people have to wrap their heads around. When we build a plan to move forward that says, when the numbers go beyond these metrics, we are going to consult with the Board of Health. And that we, this is where it kind of, it kind of, where I had to kind of step in and do interpretation was that those metrics were all exceeded. And some of them, which we've ignored a couple of weeks back, we're now trip, you know, we're talking about 50, we were at 300 cases in a two week period. Okay, so you're talking about numbers that it's like, it's unsettling and people are like, what does this all mean? And you're waiting on a board of health that's going to make, and so I called the board of health. This was, none of this was done. You know, we didn't have a public hearing on it. Um, and maybe we could have, but again, that, I don't know, you know, if they would just, if it would have just made it more kind of painful. But the idea is when I talked with chairs was that the school committee agreed on the metrics, that those were indicators that we would bring concern to. I looked at those indicators and said, um, you know, in adding other data to it in the sense of the amount of cases that we were tracking within our school, the amount of cases that the um, local uh, uh, public health nurses were dealing with, and the fact that they were reaching, their, they're close, I'm not sure they're going to say they reached their capacity, but they were close to their capacity, um, about how they're going to track all of them. We're hearing about multiple families getting multiple tests because of multiple exposures in the district, in, in locally, you know, you're seeing, you know, those kind of things where also, where I say rumors, where parents are doing the right thing and they're keeping their kids home because they are getting positive, but they're going to wait to do the testing, but they're not actually in the system as the kids staying home as being positive. So there's all these kind of different numbers where, you know, we I, I say we lost track. I said in the other meeting, and I, and I appreciate Elaine, you say don't beat yourself up, and I am unfortunately um, because I, I the, the emotion in which you know you talk about we, we we've got some. Uh, We've gotten some counseling from uh, Sarah Carlin and um, and basically, you know, basically going through the stages of grief, but people are at the angry stage. You know what I mean? And they, 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 all, think they all found it at once. And so um, I'm getting the, the end of those emails. And I, I, you know, when someone says there's going to be a petition out there, I actually said, I would sign the petition because I want my kids in school. I got two kids in the district. I want them to go. If they could go, I'd send them. But that's my role. Is My role. That's my parent at what my administrator had is I have a role to be interpreting what these metrics were supposed to represent was to alert us of a spike and to take protective action. So, you know, that's, you know, that's kind of where I ended up. So yes, we are going to modify those metrics. Okay. And I'm working with the teachers, the association to do that. And also having conversations about, and I think I'm, I may be repeating myself, but um, I'm going to say it again. Anyway, the, what do the numbers mean? Are there, are there going to be cutoff numbers versus consult numbers? And also looking at our own internal numbers, because I think we've reached a different stage of COVID. And I, I mean, I got missed earlier when I was talking, I got off track. Because we went so long without having cases or fear of cases. I mean, there was always kind of fear, but there was not like cases knocking on the door. Multiple people are waiting tests. And this person was in the building with COVID. And what does that mean? And, you know, that kind of stuff. We're now in a new phase. Where that's going to be, it's not going to come back down to five cases in Franklin County again, where we were when we were developing these things. You know what I mean? It's going to come back. There's going to be an average, there's going to be a flow of, I don't know what the numbers are going to be, but there's going to be handfuls of cases moving forward until this thing is, until it's pretty, 
months and months and months. And so we have to have them in to talk about what does that look like and what does that mean for our own internal numbers? Because we haven't had school transmission. Our protocols are very good. Um, and selling that is going to be different because it's going to be a it's going to be a shift. It's going to be a mind shift because it's before it was like COVID is not affecting us. It's out there. Now we have to say we're safe is when by handling what COVID is doing in our buildings and tracking when it comes and goes and that kind of stuff. So that's what we're going to build in our metrics, and that's what I'll share. We'll have some sort of joint meeting um, to share those there, get people's feedback, um, and hopefully get buy-in. You know, I you know we're going to be um, we're not going to get 100% buy-in. That's we're darn sure. Um, but generally, get some. Uh, I don't know. It's going to be consensus. Not going to be consensus, but you know, it's going to be. I don't know. It'll be. That's the challenge in front of me right now. You can't have <laughs> metrics and then ignore them. You know, I mean, you you just you had metrics for a reason to guide you. You can't then then see that you've met the metrics and say, oh yeah, we didn't really mean that. That that would give you no credibility at all. So you followed your metrics. Now you may adjust your metrics, but you followed your metrics, which is what right. you're supposed to do. And, and what the Board of Health, what, what they were saying from the Board of Health was that, you know, is, is, that you set, we've set these metrics up sort of earlier on, and we've now learned that the, that the numbers should reflect the safety of the schools and the students and staff at the schools rather than uh, uh, you know that that th th that's what that's what the metrics should be reflective of, and so that we need to adjust them to the, to show to, to, so that that's the dividing line, right? I except guess. except the kids, it's not the kids don't live at school; they go home into their world where there's a big outbreak. Right. So unless right. you want to build a residential and then move them all in and then don't let them go anywhere, but you know they go out into the world where their numbers are going wild. So you you just you know you can't just ignore that these children go back and forth between communities that have you know higher numbers now. Right. I mean, in Monday morning quarterbacking it, I, I could also you know we discuss whether or not uh, my original thoughts were to um, close until Wednesday, you know, and then reevaluate where the numbers are and that kind of stuff. But we didn't have enough, you know we got to rewrite the metrics and I'm not going to have the time frame to do that and pull that out. And then they're going to be rushed. And then that's going to be a, a weak point and, you know, that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, we're also going to have snow later this week. So we're going to be remote anyway. <laughs> um, that shouldn't be the cause of it, but I'm just, you know, all the things that are going through my mind. <laughs> um, Bring on a blizzard. Bring it on. <laughs> I'll take it right now. Um, yeah, I bet. You know, that'll be an easy call. <clears throat> Well, and then the other thing is that, you know, from early on, from, from day one, the, the, that Sunderland crew, I remember when we were discussing the metrics that in the very beginning, the Sunderland crew wanted the metric to be if there was a single active case in Franklin County, there would be a full, full remote in our district. Well, then, I, I think when you look at metrics, Bill, I think you bring a, a point that you got to be careful that you don't box yourself in a corner, you know, so I think like, um, I, you know, I don't want to misquote different districts but i believe one of the districts north of us has a, a, a thing if there's one case in the school the school closes well they got the one case now the schools closes they open back up got another one case and now they're closed again so you got, you got to make sure you put things in that makes sense you know because um and that's the, you know that's the next step so anyway so that's my plan moving forward is to we'll have some sort of joint meeting it's going to be during vacation week um it's going to take that much time to get it to happen um, but nobody should be going anywhere anyway. And you all just want to jump on your computers for another reason. Anyhow, so um, maybe I'm looking at um, the Tuesdays, the meeting. I think the school committee probably should meet prior to that, agree on what's moving forward to the boards of health. Because I do agree with what was said at the frontier meeting that, you know, the school committees have a role in this um, and they shouldn't just be handing it over to the board of health. They should be um, in full control of what the metrics are and um, and how those are going to be moving forward. So. All righty. On to new business. Thank you, for Darius, for all that and all your thoughtful planning around this. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, new business. Shelly, you want to lead us in a 22 budget discussion? That should be a good time. 
<laughs> It'll be quick because there's not a whole lot to discuss yet. Um, we're a little bit behind, as you all know, in the planning process. You normally would probably be looking at a first draft at this meeting, um, but our, our goal is to present a first draft in January um, and then revise from there. So we're currently looking at a level service budget, meaning that um, we will maintain existing staffing and uh, programs. Um, and then adding in any cost of living increases or um, step increases for union employees and then non-union employees as well. Um, and we'll take a look at those numbers and that'll be the first step of our process. Um, I think the town did send us, I know they did send us a request to have the budget sooner than later. Um, you know, so I've been in contact with Tom making sure that he understands where our process is and we'll do the best that we can to move things along. That makes total sense. And any any news on the generator? The $60,000 capital generator? Any news on that? Like- I don't have anything has, on that. Has, has, like has a decision been made to take that off of the capital request and put it onto- The, the town? The, the stabilization fund or the capital grammar school capital stabilization fund. I, I know, I know I did get uh, the EMS director to break to, to uh, ask Mima for our, the mass emergency associate, whatever uh, for, for money. Cause it, cause that school is the town emergency shelter. Um, yeah. I think and, it, there's tons of COVID money floating around out there. They can just slap it on there. No, they give money. They give money for all that. 911 stuff um and, and that falls into it uh yeah and uh and so so you know and, and i did get a, a a call back saying that mima would look more kindly on a much on funding a much smaller generator do we need such a big generator and if we get a generator that's one quarter of the size it, it might not cost us anything but it's a problem it's a problem when they when we want a generator as big as the one we're getting. So I don't know anything about that, but um, they're, 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 I'm, they're, sure, I'm they're, sure they've sized it to what we need. But the reason I brought that up is because if that's not gonna be in our capital request, then um, the other items that were number two or number three can move up the list and just think about that. And so can you, can you kind of break down for me? So how do we does it, an odd capital request you know so yeah. in you know shelly and i are trying to wrap our heads around because you guys do it differently than the other just the other schools in the sense that right. you have a capital stabilization account right and so are we basically it's my understanding it kind of feels like we're just basically asking for money to replenish the stabilization accounts to, to constantly keep the stabilization account at about at the hundred um the hundred and fifty thousand um mark right and yeah, so is that basically what we're doing is we're requesting to replenish the fund and then we the same year we so spend the money no the first thing we would be doing is requesting to draw out of the fund for for, for so it would be a a, a warrant for, for, to take from the capital grammar school capital stabilization fund for the generator um uh, so it requires a warrant and then and, it requires a warrant yeah, to pull then, funds from the capital stabilization account Yes, and then a second warrant to put money into this capital stabilization account, and the you know, other the and, and so that way for the needed repair, <clears throat> you get to say, look, this this is is not going to affect the assessment at all. It's money's already saved. Right. And then you can have the discussion about affecting the assessment on the need to replenish that money, which okay. is, um, uh, it, which and, and it's always it's always served the town really well because the things that go on it are easily easy to explain you know the, the generators past its due date we need a generator boom, boom. oh yeah okay that's it that's the end of the discussion it's beautiful um but uh yeah so so yeah we are we are the only one that did that 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 set that up and that was i remember when we when we set that up the very first year funding it with 50 grand um, and we've been putting money into it ever since and taking money out of it. But right. the, whole, the whole concept, the whole concept was we start, we started it 
when we got the report that the boilers were past their due date. But the boilers work fine. And so the whole idea was you wanted to have the money there in case the boilers fail, but you don't want to replace the boilers because they can last another hundred years. And if they do re get replaced, a lot of time you don't need the whole big, big replacement. You just need a smaller replacement, uh, smaller bits and pieces of it or whatever. So don't be jinxing uh, us, Phil. <laughs> well, no, so, the so clarity, that, so I guess. Right. The clarity that, that I needed, the clarity I needed was how it gets replenished. And is that done automatically when we request a pull from it? We then also request that they automatically replenish it. Right. That's where I, the replenishing is where yeah. I kind of get caught up in it. Um, right. And I didn't realize that not, it does make sense as a town account, not a school account. And so the town has to release those funds. Because I also look through Frontier's lens where Frontier controls their own accounts. Because they're their own right. town, I guess, is how you look at it. So, but it was how do you get money back in? It just automatically, right. we kind of dual act. We're going to spend, we want to replenish. And yep. most years, recently. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. But, and, and, we, and we only use that for the big stuff and not for the, you know, phone, for little work on the alarm system or whatever. So, you know, um, but that's. But so, so, so we also make separate uh, capital requests, or not capital requests, but repair requests, or whatever we label it. But there's always a, a, a smaller list of just general, whatever. Every year we've been doing stuff to the building that's not capital wise, but a carpet here or there, the air conditioner here or there, stuff like that that gets a separate warrant article too. So I guess. But so now you confused me, Phil, to make everybody more confused, but I want to be able to, right now, we have, um, let me just quickly show my screen, if you'll let me. You can't stop me, so what are you going to do? <laughs> so here is um, what we're doing for um, Conway. You know, are we moving this 18000 and this 4000 for um, the, the, the the annual classroom uh, flooring upgrades and trying to soundproof that door for that office, is this money, are we going to pull that from capital stabilization or am I asking for a warrant on that? Because yes. you said smaller numbers, well, we don't so, want to do that. So remember, we did we did pass policy defining what a capital thing is. Uh, right? I think that's a warrant. Those are warrant items. So yeah, yeah. They, I mean, so uh, when I look at the flooring upgrade, that sounds capital-ish. Um, the... I guess the sound. I, I, I guess most of that stuff is sound is capital, isn't it? I don't know. Is it a but money a, a certain? Uh, I mean, at work, it's when you're over a certain number, you become capital. Yeah, I I, I, I knew that. I, I know that this ten thousand and another. So I don't know what it is for the town yeah. of Conway. Yeah, we 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 all adopted that. Our town adopted that too the same year that frontier did because that was all part of getting the bond for the track right or right. before that yeah um so um so i mean if, if it's all capital then we just then just make it all for the capital stabilization fund and then that's what we're then that's, that's what we're doing we'll be moving those two four pieces forward for the capital stabilization fund and the generators on the back burner um Makes sense. All right. For a short discussion, that was long. All right. Sorry. On. Sorry. Not Shelly's fault either. All I'm right. I'm sorry. All right. All right. All right. Okay. We're on to the school improvement plan, which we need a vote on, which hopefully we all reviewed. Uh, it's very comprehensive, Kristen, which is awesome. Uh, you want to talk to us about it, Kristen, for a minute? Well, I have Carol and Paulette here too, who are on the, um, we have a great school council again this year. Um, Carol and Paulette are teacher representatives. And then we have um, three parents and a, um, a community member. So our area of focus is again, like Elaine said, I won't go through it um, bit by bit because I'm sure that you've looked over as the social emotional piece, which is obviously the most important piece right now. Um, this, we're as a staff, we're doing some really good work in the area of grief and trauma. Um, both in terms of caring 
for for ourselves and each other and then um, onto the children. So we started that work, which I think has been great work. Um, and then just other things that we'll be doing in that area. And of course our, you know, second area, and it really is our second area of focus is instructional practice. Obviously student growth is so important in school, but this year um, seeing children come to, you know, we made a goal right from the start. We want all of our children to be happy coming to school be happy in school and when they go home at the end of the day saying that they had a happy day i think we've been very successful in that area do you agree paula and carol and so um instructional practice you know it, it's really interesting um when we look at the assessments that we we did in the fall it's really clear no surprise that math took a bigger dip than ela um but um I know some teachers are going to like cringe when I say this, but it's really true. Many, many of our kids are right back where they need to be. Um, I don't, that's not to put pressure on any teachers at all because we expect to slide, but we, you know, we have a good number of students are, that are right back where they need to be in the academic areas. Um, the, the teaching staff and the, uh, the instructional assistants and have done just a remarkable job um, getting those kids back to where they they should be um and we're talking a lot about doing parent workshops because some parents are really struggling for example in the area of math and when kids are remote it's sort of like we're doing borrowing at home but you're calling it something else in math so we're talking about doing some workshops and other um our ilt instructional leadership team is up and running and then our third goal is the anti-racism work that we're all doing um, throughout the whole district. Um, we did participate in Monty's March again this year, which was great. Um, and then our last goal being um, opportunities for community and family engagement and just communication in general. We have lots of great ideas in that area that we're looking forward to in 2021. Carol and Paula, did you wanna add anything else to it? our plan um it's very student and staff focused um and you know i want to i want to just let you know as, as an aside because this really is my principal report but um we have received um fourteen hundred dollars in donations from a couple of the mm, wonderful churches the women's auxiliary um Asiolo, um for um Christmas for some of our children who have been, whose families have been affected by COVID and children in need. Um, the staff has done something wonderful for our children, but in addition, we've um, received this outpouring of support and donations um, from people. I mean, pe people are just wonderful, just saying, here, give to the kids, give to the kids, give to the kids. So um, it's a, it, as I say, I have the best job in the world. It's the best staff, students, school committee, parents, community. It's, Superintendent, I always tell them, tell Darius, don't go ruining my life. Stay right where you are. <laughs> do, do you need more donations, Kristen? Anything no, like, specific? Thank, you, thank you so much. We had very specific things. You know, you know, we, we were our big buy was a bed and various other things. But we actually thank you so much. But we are actually in really good shape right now. But thank you. Really very. Yeah, thank you. We had, so, we, had this, we had the same thing at work. We sponsored a family and it was so overwhelming what people best. donated that we, we took on another family because and yeah, it just was really amazing. Really so, is. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm excited about the school improvement plan because it's a sort of a guide for us. So we meet, you know, every month and we sort of, okay, what did we do? How are we here? So, um, you know, we use that. We really use our school improvement plan as a working document um, with our school council. So, no, if anyone has any questions. Well, usually school improvement plans are something people write and stick in their top drawer. So it's really nice to see, and you can kind of tell when you read it. It's actually sort of a, a live document. So, um, at least I don't know what other people thought, but I just thought it really seemed stuff you're updating us all on the time that really seems to be in the forefront of what the school is doing and isn't just you know something you create and stick in the top drawer so thanks elaine thank you yeah. mm -hmm. i have a great team any I'm, other comments i didn't have any 
questions about the document itself, but it, it did make me think about how with our recent switch back to remote um, and the upcoming holidays and how families are, you know, dealing with staying home and, and not necessarily being able to, you know, meet up with friends and family and things like that. Like that first goal uh, about, you know, ideas about well-being and sharing things with students um, and just other like community type of engagement parts of this plan. I was wondering if there's anything planned for next week um, before kids leave for the holidays, just to kind of um, talk about how to stay healthy and, and emotionally healthy as well while we're kind of away from each other. It's like, you know, being away from school, you, you don't, if you're not going out and hanging out with your friends, you're away from this constant contact with your peers and it can be hard sometimes. So. Yeah. Um, good, good point, Michael. And, you know, as I said before, um, the kids are so happy to be in school. I had a little second grader, um, say to me one day last week she had no idea about numbers or co you know she just was so happy to be in school she said mrs gordon i don't care what happens in the future um i'll wear a hazmat suit and boots and gloves and i'm coming to this school every day it was really cute um so yeah michael the teachers are are really working on exactly that what can you do for yourself what can you but next week we do have some things in um so we have some reading with the Red Hawks, which is going to lead to a read aloud from me and some various other things. And Mr. Tracia's um, having a, what's it called, Paula and Kara, bongo idol or something? Yeah, it was something like that. And we just had the concert with... Um, we had the concert, which was amazing. Um, uh, TJ Conway came and did a concert and it was, it, it, the kids, they were just, they're just loving being together. And we're going to have an all school meeting and, you know, we can have Shafia um, talk to the kids. But we've been we've been talking to um, parents and kids individually as well. Um, you know, as I said, it, the kids love being in school. We love having them be in school. Um, but as I said, too, I wasn't going to have a staff after. <laughs> after so, you know, it's a it's a tough balance. Um, so. I didn't really answer your question. That's always on our mind. We're always talking about the emotional well-being of the kids. And, you know, it's different this time too, Michael, as you know, because from March to June, a lot of parents were not working. They were, I were, they were working from home or they were remote or they were home more. Um, now what we have is parents who are back to work, grandparents who are watching uh, children, which is lovely and wonderful, but technology is way over their heads. So we've sort of been working on this all along with the kids. You know, a couple of classes have feeling journals and things like that. Miss Finger's still working with kids, and um, but you know, you bring up a good point with a holiday break. You know? Yeah, just, just day the half day, and um, I also think about all of these students have done all this work. Like, there's it's a tremendous amount of learning that these students have participated in. And um, so, and the care that they've taken with themselves to maintain their own learning progression. Um, yeah, yeah. We need to celebrate that too. Yeah, we have some fun things planned, and then on Thursday, um, which we pro we think you know there'll be snow. Um, I emailed the staff today, and I told them to consider in their plans for Thursday some so snow play time throughout the day. You know, um, go out and play in the snow. And then, you know, we're going to meet at 10 o'clock and you're going to come tell me what you did. Are you going to take a picture? Are you going to do whatever? So giving them some opportunities to do that. Um, actually, that was Darius's idea that I ran with, but letting it be like a snow day. But yeah, kids have been great about taking ownership of their learning. And, you know, you hear stories of, you know, uh, the little third grader when it's, it's time to go and do their work. And Mrs. Decision said, okay, you can come back in 20 minutes. No, I'd rather just stay here. I'll do my work while, you, while you're sitting here. So there Mary sits and doesn't really need much. Only needs Mary being right there. You know, there's just all sorts of cute stories. Like, the kids are looking for that. Um, 
I think all the students are going to need to call the superintendent at 5 a.m. because he's going to be lonely having to not have to call a snow day, right? <laughs> Michael, I hope you don't mind me sharing this, but um, one of my best things, too, there's so many best things, was um, your wife had a picture that I, I, she shared, and um, it was, you know, your little second grade daughter who loves school and doing fabulous and mom said, I often go in to peek and see how uh, uh, remote learning's going. And here's our little Juliet ready for remote learning. And it was like a 20 minute break. And she had, she had, well, she was playing dress up. She had dressed up in her gown and she had her hair. <laughs> Loving that, you know, during her 20 minutes, she was dressing herself up for class. It was adorable. Make the most she's having, of it. She's having a, a really great year. So I, I yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, so thanks. All right, everyone. so I need a, a, a motion to approve the school improvement plan. I'll make a motion. Can I have Thank a second? You. Sure. All righty. Uh, Phil, Can are you in favor? Great. Yes. Ashley's in. Phil's in. Denise? Yep. Yes. yes. All right. Michael? Yes. And I approve. So it's unanimous to adopt the, and vote for the school improvement plan. One of my staff uh, members who's watching just texted me and said, oh, don't forget to tell them that we're having a spirit week with different things that they can do throughout the week. Oh, cool. Great. Um, so we had the principal's report. I do not have a report. The superintendent gave us his COVID report, and that's enough of a report. Um, do we have a collaborative report that we need or no? Um, I've been to two different meetings and a lot of it is really focused on the retirement of the director. Mm. So, but it's really amazing work that they do. So I'm just kind of tuning in and learning more about it, but it's pretty amazing. Cool. Yeah, they do some amazing things. Absolutely. All righty. It seems like that is a wrap. Uh, do we need executive session for anything, Darius? No. No. Excellent. All righty. So that is it. Can I have a motion to adjourn? I will make a motion to adjourn. Awesome. Second. Second. Um, happy holidays, everybody. And uh, stay safe and keep up the good work. And please be gentle with yourselves because this has been a very amazing, trying time. So.